Gold Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio. Well, hello and welcome to the podcast as we look ahead to round four of the Six Nations. Joining me this week as ever is Steve Cording. Hi, Steve. Morning, Lawrence. How are you doing? Uh, who is... Grumpy, miserable, excited. Well, well, thankfully, we've had a day's grace because we're actually recording on Tuesday this week and not Monday because if you'd spoken to me yesterday, then I wouldn't have spoken to you at all after the Manchester derby on Sunday, particularly given that our guest this week is a big Liverpool fan as well. So He is indeed, <laughs> without giving anything and away. And he's chuckling now in the background. Oh. It makes it even worse. Our special guest and only second behind Brian O'Driscoll on the number of people that listen to him when he comes on to our podcast True. is Ben Kay, Benny Boy. Um how are you first? A fallow week for rugby, which is a bit strange, isn't it? So I guess we're watching the Ramble game and um, well, Andy Carroll managed to score yeah. the winner for, um, for Liverpool, didn't he? Stoppage time. <laughs> <laughs> Good knowledge. He's a better Andy Carroll. He's a better Andy Carroll. Uh, yeah, obviously in Fergie time. So uh, you had it for a number of years, Steve. We'll... we'll uh... We'll take that on. That um, yeah, we've not had it for yeah, a long we'll time. We'll take everything like... we can get. It was no uh, no hint of any controversy in the end of the Liverpool game. Let's just move on, not talk about it. Well, <laughs> Benny, what were you? Um, I mean, you know, it's a rare weekend for us, and like an oasis in the desert where there is no rugby. A lot of our listeners, you know, complaining that maybe the Six Nations to just carry on through. Really, no Premiership rugby, no European rugby. What uh, what happened in the Ben K household then? If there's no rugby on, you've got to stay at home. It well, I didn't actually. It was bonkers. The um, yeah, I don't think I've had a complete weekend without any rugby for about ten years. So yeah. um, you know, the the way that uh, the Premiership's gone with with less teams, uh, Premiership Cup. I thought they might have played the Premiership Cup final this weekend, but mm. yeah, it's a, it, like you said, an oasis in the desert. And I I popped off for a quick couple of days skiing. So uh, fantastic first weekend off I've had since um, totally off since uh, before the World Cup started in August. So. And, and did the avalanche warning go up when you arrived on resort, or uh, are you a very, uh, are you a very, very well balanced? <laughs> About skier? halfway down. <laughs> Good About man. Halfway down when I'd done uh, th- three somersaults, but not deliberately. <laughs> well, listen, round four is looming this weekend, Ben. You, you were last when you were last on the pod. We were previewing the Six Nations at the beginning of the tournament. Uh, we'll get into the nitty gritty of England's performance, looking at what's to come at the weekend in just a minute. But in a nutshell, what, I mean, how do you assess the tournament so far, given that we're we're three rounds in? Um, well, I think they do. I, I sort of said beforehand that I thought France had bounced back and that they were the favourites and clearly totally wrong. Um, they're a team that are struggling with a World Cup hangover and uh, the Irish look like they're on a procession to a Grand Slam at the moment. So yeah. uh, a bit disappointing in that regard. You, you want at least two teams to be really vying for it and playing great rugby. And at, at, at the moment, um, you know, you, you think that that's the case. Scotland have obviously performed fantastically well, good mix of playing well, uh, but also some tenacity and also playing the right style of rugby as they did against England. They let England make all the mistakes and yeah. they capitalised on them. So um, it's not it's not been the greatest Six Nations we've had yet, but there's still a couple of rounds to, to sort that out and, um, you know, a couple of potential banana skins still in there. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I think we all pointed to that opening game, didn't we, France against Ireland and thought whoever wins that probably wins the championship. Didn't expect the French to maybe mentally capitulate quite so quickly. Um, Ireland were magnificent, no. but, mm. but it's hard to know exactly how well Ireland plays because France were poor. There, there's something going on in France that's that's not doesn't quite ring true. You know, Fabian Gauthier is under a bit of pressure. Ibanez, seemingly, you know, the garden was very rosy and now he's been sort of cast aside. Dupont has decided to take absence of leave, you know, justifiably so, winning the sevens in LA over the weekend for the first time. I think it's their first sevens uh, title, the French. But, but things aren't quite right there. Ireland, on the other hand, are flying. I think we all expected England maybe to to move forward a step and, and maybe take Scotland's place as the third best team in the championship, but they haven't managed to do that just yet. Um, and the rest is, is kind of played out um, as we expected. Highlight for me, probably Italy's performance against France mm. um, and unfortunately didn't get the win. Uh, well, highlight for you so far, Ben? Not that there's been, it's been spectacular. No, I think I'd agree with you on that. You know, the um, that game, uh, France and Italy, was, was was particularly being over in France. I yeah. think you know we've always thought that 
Italy against the big teams could could run them close at home, but to do it um, uh, in France, albeit in Lille, that that was a, a step up for them. And and you know, a lot of people have been suggesting that Italy should be relegated from from the Six Nations, but you know, finally we're starting to see a team that consistently uh, putting teams under pressure, not always getting the results. Um, but we've seen them almost beat France at home. We've seen them also, almost beat Scotland at yeah. home and, and then obviously beat Wales yeah. a couple of years ago in Cardiff. So they're a team that are on the cusp of, of being competitive, or, or, albeit not right at the top of the table, but certainly deserving of their place on it. What, what buffoon suggested yeah, that Italy we'll, should be we'll relegated? Spare your blushes, uh, Steve. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, moving, we'll... moving swiftly on. Um, so anyway, let's look at Twickenham, shall we, this weekend. Um, Ireland... Heading to uh, Twickenham with a commanding lead at the top of the table. They actually will win the championship with a bonus point win um, over England, which I guess all the neutrals don't want because we want it to go into the uh, final round. Last time out, England lost to Scotland, fourth consecutive year. Um, so, I mean, heading that weekend, I can't really see any other win other than Ireland. I did read this morning that England's tactics, based on Opta stats, uh, guys, I know I know rugby's not played with stats, but they do suggest a lot that the way for England to win is to keep the ball tight um, and to kick over a thousand metres in the game, which will probably bore us to tears. But Lawrence, is that the only way that England can win on Saturday? Well, it, listen, it, it, Steve Balthwick is definitely uh, very much processed by data in terms of you know how he likes to select, how he picks. Listen, it won um, less to the title. When he took over in a in a very precarious position, uh, he turned things around very quickly. Um, it almost got England to a World Cup final, didn't it? You know, he played uh, a particular game against South Africa based on on uh, uh, you know a bit more on science really than selection necessarily. And England are a caught in two stalls at the moment. You know, he and the England coaches are trying to move England away from a particular attacking style, which requires probably a lot more time spent on attack. And it's that constant push-pull in any team. You know, there's only a certain number of hours in the day. You've only got players for a certain time. You can't overtrain them. You've got set-piece, scrum, line-out, restarts. You've got defence. You've got all the other things. But you've also got attack. And how much time do you actually spend on your attacking game? Um, and if you do spend, you know, more time than, they, than, than, uh, than, than you have previously, then something else has to give. Mm. And, and at the moment, um, England aren't quite sure... You know, it's pretty clear they're not spending enough time on attack, but they want to win games. Let's explain how that works, because obviously the layman reading over the weekend that some England backs only touch the ball once yeah. during a training session doesn't seem yeah. like... It. How, how on earth can that happen? Surely you just split mm. forwards and backs. The backs go off and do their moves. The forwards do their line-out drills, their scrums, but that's not how it works. No, no, no. Well, listen, it, it is in, in, in moments. Um, obviously, you have to defend as a team um, because... Uh, you know that's that's what happens in a game, but set piece is important. England scored a try, a George Furbank try directly mm. from first phase. So you don't need the forwards to practice those moves. They, they the backs can go off and do those. Where where the game becomes deconstructed is after two three phases. So what you have to do is you have to imagine that you're going to win your first phase ball. You're going to see, you know you're going to get over the gain line, which is might be in the middle of the park. Then you're going to move the ball to one of the touch lines. It's then third phase onwards that you need to practice because really the art of rugby is about trying to find mismatches, isn't it? Yeah. Not, and you very rarely find a mismatch after you know two phases. And where England really struggle, I think, personally, is when they get into the 22 or the edge of the 22 and they've got maybe three phases, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever it might be. Um, and that's the bit that they need to practice because that is where you need the forwards interchanging with the backs um, we used to have a golden rule that if certain players touch the ball, like a Dan Cole, for instance, mm. either side, if it, if it wasn't either side of the breakdown, then something's gone horribly wrong in your attack, really, because you do not want guys like that slowing down the attacking momentum. Right. Uh, equally, ideally, you want to get your wingers or, or, or some of your faster players with the ball in hand against people like me and Ben Kay, where, you know, out in the wide open spaces where things are going to be difficult. So, Ben, uh, just on England, you know, we can be quick to criticise, but... They are the coaches are trying to move this game away from um, you know what it was in the World Cup, and I guess when you make the number of mistakes that England did in the Scotland game, you know, it's it's going to raise a few question marks, isn't it? Of course it is. Um, England's big problem at the moment is 
I think rightfully so. They, they've looked at changing their their defensive style. Obviously, Felix Jones has come in. They're trying to employ the same style as South Africa, very similar to uh, Exeter Chiefs' defensive style at the moment. So I think that's why we're seeing uh, a bit of a disconnect between Henry Slade, who's very confident in, in that uh, defensive style, uh, and, for example, Elliot Daly. And, and a couple of times England have been broken. You've seen Slade just go, and it's almost that fraction of a second hesitation from Daly going, what's he doing? Because he's not used to playing in exactly the same style. So we know that it took South Africa a long time to to connect all the dots and all be on the same page. And then, you know, the way they defend now is, is the blueprint for, for a lot of teams, but it takes a while to get to there. You factor in that England are also trying to shift on their attack. They said they'd move to a, a slightly more... Um, Entertaining is not the reason they're doing it, but entertaining style of attack and not just based on field position and kicking. And, you know, they started that Scotland game. First 10 minutes, I, I thought, wow, what's this? You know, this is a different side. They were trying to attack from everywhere. But then their confidence got hit. I think probably from that first two and under Merva try where, where uh, Tui Pilotto uh, broke through the middle. Again, with a fault from their defensive system, their new defensive system. And I, I think that, you know, that just dented their confidence. And as soon as you don't believe in what you're doing, as soon as you're not, it's just not a natural flow, a second nature thing, there's hesitation. And all those errors from England was hesitation because that doubt had crept into the back of their mind. And it's going to take, That's the, I think that's the tough thing for an international side is how you shift your game on. Because, you know, you're in the, you're in the spotlight all the time for your results. You yeah. have to get your performances right. You don't have time to have a transition phase. And that's England's problem. They're almost in a transition phase in a number of areas at the moment. Yeah. But the, the the public, I'm sure the RFU bosses, won't give them that time to, to move on. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's very different. When Borthwick took over with England, with, with Leicester, sorry, he moved the defence on and he gradually added things on to it. That, that took about 18 months. You know, is he going to get 18 months as an England coach mm. to finally get to a place where people can see that it's moving in the right direction? Do you think that they've tried to do too much too quickly um, in the sense that, you know, like you said at Leicester, <clears throat> it went from, from one extreme to the other. Then they they were a team that were kicking a lot, but they, they were adding layers onto their attack slowly but surely. What you've just said there, Ben, <clears throat> excuse me, is absolutely right. They've They've completely new coaches, new players, Deconstructing and then and then rebuilding their defensive systems and also at the same time trying to do exactly the same in attack mm. and um, I guess the the challenge will be I mean I said at the beginning of the championship that success for this team this group has to be winning more games than they lose they won the opening two albeit unconvincingly but they still won them they've lost against Scotland pretty emphatically. In my in my mind, to 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 look like they've moved on, they have to win one of the next two games. Mm. Now the challenge yeah. is: Do you stick with the game plan of new defence, new attack, and play against Ireland and France in exactly the same way, or do you find because I think well, Steve has to win one of these next two games? Well, I also think that he um, he will play a, a game plan for the teams that he's playing, and yeah, you know, that the Scotland attack shift was quite surprising for me because. You know, in the first couple of games, I didn't think their attack really did look to challenge much. They, they were sort of almost still doing the same stuff yeah. from uh, from the World Cup. And, and I think he pinpointed that actually the way to shock Scotland into you know a, a, a victory was was to come out with a game plan they weren't expecting. And it, it start, started really well. It was only when that confidence got dented. I, I think he'll go back to not trying to take Ireland on an all-out attack game because they might score a few tries, but Ireland will probably score more. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Ireland would back themselves. So uh, I think that the, the figure point that they'll have worked on over the last couple of weeks for Ireland, purely because of how good the Irish attack is, yeah. will be around winning winning the breakdown battle. When Ireland lose, they, they tend to lose the number of turnovers in a game. Yeah. I know they mm. lose infrequently, but that, that's been a big factor for them. And it's those big um, you know, big moments in game, the momentum shifting moments in a game, the likes of Itoji coming up with a bit a bigger turnover underhill. But also if you're targeting that, you're slowing Ireland's breakdown down. And 
the reason that the success of the Irish, I think, in their attack has been the speed of ball they've been getting from the breakdown. So I think there'll be a massive focus on that. England will probably be happy for Ireland to have the ball more than they will be themselves. But then they need to be destructive in stopping the Irish attack and really frustrating Ireland. Look, it's a tough job, but I yep. think that's their, their, their only real chances of, of winning. Well, let's take a look at our QBE predictor is saying for this weekend. Uh, it simulated the tournament 10,000 times, producing outcome from 150,000 games, with every match replicated by generating a number of tries, conversions and penalties scored by each team. It's doing quite well so far. Nine games, haven't we? And so far it's picked seven winners. Obviously didn't predict a draw, uh, which is a pretty hard thing to do uh, between France and and Italy, it's actually forecasting an Irish win this weekend, 27 to 18, which is probably hard to disagree with. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, we picked our, well, you picked your England teams when we when you came on last time, Ben, for the game against Italy. Looking at it now, is is it even possible to pick a starting 15 for this game that England will play? I mean, you look at Ireland, it's pretty much nailed on what their starting 15 will be, but there seems so uncertain, so much uncertainty is around so many positions. Or would you stick with the team that went to Scotland and say, go for it again, boys, you've got to prove, as, prove yourselves to be able to do this? I'd probably wouldn't shift too far away because otherwise that looks like a, a sheer panic. The one thing I would do is if, if they're going to play this game around winning turnovers and slowing Ireland down and being really strong. You obviously need people that can compete over the uh, ball at the breakdown. Um, but I would add in some stardust that are going to get you tries out of nothing. And I thought Faye Waboso, when he came on um, against Scotland, was, was absolutely superb. He, he is raw. He's green. He probably isn't ready for test level in some areas of his game quite yet. But, you know, I think England have suffered in the past from picking Pick, or not picking people for what they can't do rather than picking them for what they can do. And, and he's a guy that huge confidence at the moment. I, I'd gamble with putting him in straight into the starting team and then letting England try and thrive off that turnover ball. And, and what England have to do is have that mindset that when they get the turnovers, they're not just going to give it to a forward to crash it up. They're going to play three or four passes away from it, get it into the hands of someone like Faye Uboso, and you actually you make some you stress teams. Then, if you just turn the ball over and then give them time, give the opposition time to settle defensively. There's no point in having it. You'll get you'll end up kicking it back to them. So, when England do play, it needs to be with shock, and they need to get it into the hands of someone that can actually cause some damage. So, I'd bring Faye Waboso into the team. I also I think they've missed a trick in not having Alfie Barbary there. I think he's someone that 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 could really. Yeah, you know, I've watched him on his um, on his debut. I think it was when he scored a hat trick for Wasps. He's just a player that rises to to every challenge that he's given, and it's something different to what England have got. So anyway, uh, we need predictions from both of you. Just to say, um, in the last three games, there has been a red card. Um, we're hoping there isn't one. Although Jamie Heaslip has said that if Ireland play with twelve or thirteen players, England might have a chance. So, um, but the one thing. The, of note is that the last time Ireland lost to New Zealand, New Zealand didn't make one single handling error. And I think that's the way that England have got to play on Saturday. But what do you think, Lawrence? Can you see a quick prediction from both of you for who's going to win? Uh, listen, I think England, of course, have got a chance of winning the game. Um, I, I, I don't think they will, though, as much as I want them to. Um, it's gonna. It, it, I think the gap is such a big one to bridge. Mm. Um, I think it'll be closer than people think, um, but I think England will win. I think Eng it, sorry, Ireland will win. I do think England's best opportunity of getting the elusive win that they want, the one more that takes them over two, um, will be away in France because I think France are. Uh, are there for the taking myself even in even even in France I think England can go to Lyon and win that game mm -hmm. but uh, and they'll be they'll be boosted by a significantly better performance against Ireland but I don't think it'll be quite enough to win Ben I think this this game uh, for me 100 percent I feel Ireland are going to win it uh, I'd love to be proven wrong uh, scoreline is so difficult because England could have their best performance of the tournament yeah. and because of the um, fluidity and accuracy of Ireland's attack, 
Alan could score three tries, uh, you know, more and absolutely thrash England, but it still could be England's best uh, performance of the tournament. Equally, you know, our, England could play really, really well uh, or, or not so well, and it could be a tight arm wrestle of a game. So, you know, I think that um, uh, the, the predictor was, was probably about right for, yeah. for, for the gap. I, I'd like to think that England could get closer. Um, and if they're in it at the end, within seven points, so let's say 24-18, uh, yep. um, I, I think that would be a, be, be a performance that, that we're looking for. Eng England have to be in it at the end yep. and not... Yeah you know, not chasing the game at the end as so often has been. And by chasing, I mean chasing to get back to some some level of pride. Um, and then if they're they're within seven points at the end of the game, let's hope for, for a miracle from Faye Uwaboso. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's all for this week. Thanks to Ben Kay, to the dynamic duo. You decide which one from the Evening Standard, Steve Cording and Nick Puruel, and also our hosts, VoxPod Studios. We'll be back next week. Until then, enjoy the rugby and goodbye. Mm -hmm.